I would like to introduce you to one of my patients. Kato was an orphaned forest elephant that I met when my family and I were living in Gabon, Africa, and an elephant-loving oil man had rescued him after his mother had been killed while crop raiding in a local village. He wanted to know could I help. So I hopped on a helicopter out to the middle of the forest and then a truck ride out to base camp in this oil field. And this is where I first saw Kato. And, and he didn't look so good, but really who could blame him. He had just lost his mother, and now he was surrounded by people and drilling machinery. So over the, the coming days, we nursed him with some medicines and milk replacement formula and, and what he probably needed the most, love. Despite all our efforts, it wasn't enough, and I think of this little elephant every day. I always knew I wanted to be a wildlife veterinarian. I went to veterinary college and graduate school, and I even survived a three-year residency in zoo and wildlife medicine. And I know my training helped me realize my dream, but I'm, I'm sure it didn't hurt that I had clocked hundreds of hours watching Tarzan and Jane, both Tarzan's Jane and Jane Goodall. I knew I wanted to help save endangered species, and I've been able to do just that with my career. I've worked for some of the best zoos in the world with the past 10 years on staff at the St. Louis Zoo. And as a zoo veterinarian, I have treated lions and tigers and even bears like this nine-day-old giant panda cub. Oh, <laughs> mostly, mostly I've worked with wildlife in the wild in countries from Argentina to Zimbabwe. In Central Africa, I removed a, a poacher's snare from a big, beautiful bull elephant in the prime of his life. In South America, I worked to protect maned wolves, these amazing long-legged fox-like creatures, protect them from viruses like rabies and canine distemper, viruses that may spill over from domestic dogs that are encroaching on their habitat. And traveling the world and providing veterinary care to all types of animals, it has become abundantly clear. The wild is less wild than it once was, and the health of wildlife increasingly impacted by the growing human footprint. So I'd like to share a story about a fungus. In 2006, this fungus arrived in New York State, and it was probably carried there on the shoes of some unsuspecting traveler into the US from Europe, where it's native. And this fungus likes bats, and I mean it really likes bats. In Europe, bats aren't harmed because they evolved with it, so they have an immunity. Our bats hadn't seen the fungus before it arrived, so they had no immunity. So bats began to get sick and bats began to die. They died of the disease called white nose syndrome. The name of the disease this fungus causes because of the white noses of infected bats. Bats began to die by the thousands, and then bats began to die by the millions as it's moved across our continent. This fungus has now infected bats in 32 states and five Canadian provinces. It has been called the biggest wildlife emergency in U.S. history ever. In 12 short years, we have lost six million bats. Okay, so right about now, some of you may be thinking, I don't even like bats, so why is she telling me this really sad bat story? Uh, so, so let's think about what bats do, right? So one of the things they do is they pollinate plants and all kinds of plants. One plant they pollinate is called the agave. And if that sounds familiar, it's that agave, the one that gives you tequila. <laughs> So, no bats, no agave, and no margaritas. <laughs> happy hours, a little less happy, right? Bad health, a little more interesting, right? So, so, what else do bats do for us? Well, they eat pests, and they eat lots of pests. A single bat might eat 6,000 mosquitoes in 24 hours. So now you may be thinking, okay, so if we've lost six million bats and each bat can eat 6,000 mosquitoes in one night, that is a heck of a lot of mosquitoes, right? <laughs> so, so now this one disease may have you thinking about 
and we're going to be honest, primarily where, where you'll get your next margarita, but also if there are, the bats aren't there and there are mosquitoes, will we reach for more pesticides? Pesticides that might be carcinogenic to you, that might impact your health or your family's health. So suddenly, and if, if we don't reach for pesticides, maybe the, the mosquitoes will be there and bite you with viruses like West Nile virus or Zika virus. Suddenly this sad little bat disease may potentially have devastating impacts on your health. So this story demonstrates the connection of the health of animals, environments, and humans. But it is, it is far from the only example. You can change bats to vultures or bees or giraffe, and the health threat from a fungal pathogen to a bacteria or virus, a hunter's bullet or an environmental contaminant, your choice. All these examples, the common thread is the ties that bind the health of environments, animals, and humans. They represent one health. And One Health reminds us that the health of all life is interdependent. We are linked in ways we are just starting to fully comprehend. And we need an interdisciplinary, holistic approach to solve the health challenges of today. So why now? Well, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I would say Earth is in a bit of a hot mess. And I, I mean that both figuratively and literally, right? The challenges on this slide threaten public health, wildlife conservation, and environmental stability. Climate change is possibly the, the poster child of these threats, but the other challenges here are just as real and potentially just as devastating. The one that I think a lot about is the loss of biodiversity or the loss of species. Because every time a species goes extinct, we lose its role in the environment, its ecosystem services. We lose its unique genetic code, the DNA that may code for some yet to be discovered life-saving drug. Today in 2018, the rate of species extinctions is up to a hundred times the baseline normal rate. We haven't seen species extinctions like that since the time the dinosaurs were checking out. Experts estimate we may lose three species an hour. One may go extinct during the course of this very short talk. And these extinctions are being caused by one highly successful and intelligent species, Homo sapiens, you and me. I also think a lot about pollution these days, and plastic pollution in particular. And I know plastics are awesome, and we use them in virtually everything today. But now they are everywhere because plastics degrade really slowly and we use lots of them. And just one example, in the US we use 500 million plastic straws a day. If you put these end to end, you will circle the earth two and a half times. This is just plastic straws, this is just the US, and that is just one day. Plastics are not just making the planet look less healthy, they're making it less healthy. And, and this may be in ways you're not even considering, and that is the chemicals that make plastics plastics. Many of these chemicals have endocrine-disrupting capabilities. They, they mess with your hormone. And the, the most famous is probably bisphenol A or BPA, but there are hundreds of others that have this endocrine-disrupting capability. So I'd like to share another story, and in this story we have plastics and turtles and sex. But don't worry, turtles, sex, as in gender, okay? And we're gonna start with a biology lesson. So the sex of humans and other mammals is determined by chromosomes. We all learned that in school, right? For many turtle species, the sex of the turtle is determined by the temperature at which the turtle is incubating. So for most turtle species, it's low temperatures are male and high temperatures are female, right? So this is really easy. We have 
cool dudes and hot babes, <laughs> right? So we all learn that. But what, what might this weird way that turtles decide what their gender are going to be, what, what does that have to do with your health? And, and that's a really good question, but stick with me. We did a study. We incubated turtle eggs at low temperatures, so male producing temperatures where 100% should be males. But we took a subset of these and we exposed them to bisphenol A or BPA, amounts of BPA that are in our rivers. And what did we find? So no BPA, 100% males. And the turtles that had been exposed with BPA in amounts that are found in our rivers, 33% were feminized. 33% with the amounts of BPA that is in our rivers. So even I appreciate that turtles are not humans. But these chemicals are in our waterways and tin cans. They are in our breast milk and amniotic fluids. We are bathed in these chemicals. Might there be a link with the earlier onset of puberty in girls or menopause in women, or the lower sperm count or sperm quality in men in some geographic regions? Or what of the current human obesity crisis and the lipogenic or the fat per fat creating capabilities that these endocrine disruptors also possess. Plastics are a threat to the health of environments, animals, and humans alike. So probably no surprise to you all, but I think about planetary health a lot and the health of all life. And I, I like to compare it to a visit to the doctor. So you go in for your annual checkup and your doctor asks some questions and does some tests and then she says, you need to stop overeating. Slow down on the smoking and drinking and for the love of God, do some exercise. You are headed for a heart attack. I think most of us would not like to admit it, but we probably will not do a darn thing until that heart attack happens. Lifestyle changes are hard and life is busy. Well, folks, I think we're sitting on the threshold of a planetary heart attack, and I think we get closer every day. The half a million people in Cape Town, South Africa today are counting down to day zero or the day their tap water runs dry. We are moving pathogens and vectors and animals and plants across the globe from one continent to the next. We have created areas like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, an area in the Pacific Ocean twice the size of Texas with our plastic waste. Scientists estimate by 2050, there will be more weight from plastics than from fish in our oceans. Yes, the heart attack is coming. Unless we make changes now, today, the warnings are out there, so we have time. We can take action. You can take action. You can make wise choices, and you can start today. So what can you do? Learn about these shared threats that connect the health of environments, animals, and you. Share your new knowledge with others in way that, uh, ways that affect policy changes. Use your voice, your vote, your pocketbook in ways that lead to improved planet for you, your family, and your planet. Go meatless for a meal, a day, a year, a lifetime. Help pollinators build bee houses and bat houses. Buy local, or better yet, just buy less. And eliminate the use of single stream plastics. Don't use plastic straws, plastic bottles, plastic bags. Straws suck anyway. <laughs> so, so you may be thinking, will one or two plastic straws make a difference? Can I make a difference? Yes and yes. Change will happen, it always does, but you get to decide whether that change will be for planetary health. You get to decide whether the next generations will have a healthy and bright future, an earth that continues to welcome humans and all the other amazing species like 
elephants and maned wolves and turtles and redwood trees. We have one home and in it, all life is connected by one health. Thank you.